A good day to all of you out there, and welcome to the program agenda. I'm your host, Sito Beltran. <clears throat> Today is August 31, 2021. It's a Tuesday, the last day of August in this year, and we hope that you are all doing well, that you are rested and in good health, and if for any reason you are struggling or just uh, having to, you know, if you feel down, Please uh, pray and just uh, be be lifted up, and we hope that uh, somehow, as you watch the program today, you will find encouragement. In any case, <clears throat> today we will be going back to the focus on COVID, but this time a different angle. First off, we will uh, be interviewing with an expert on pediatric infectious diseases because oftentimes, and you know, it's always been out of sight, out of mind. Pagating sa mga bata, when it comes to children, children are not to be seen, not to be heard. We, we put them in their rooms, etc. And the same thing with COVID-19. They're last on the line, uh, last in the list for vaccination, and very little has been said about children's cases, so we'll tackle that. And after that, we will speak to someone who is a former Secretary of Health, is a regular here on uh, Agenda, and we'll ask her to give us an assessment on wh whether our fight against COVID-19 or the strategy is still working or not, what can be done, what should be done. All of that here on an agenda. In the meantime, let's go to the front page of the Philippine Star. Okay, the front page headline, the banner headline, new COVID-19 cases soar to record 22,366 cases. At the top of the head of the front page, health workers walk out, demand SRA for all. Medyo nakakabigla po yan kagabi. Nakita natin sa mga balita and we monitored it on the radio that a number of hospitals were actually uh, host to protest march, walk out, uh, noise barrage of health workers. So hindi po isang lugar lang, maraming hospital, iba-ibang hospital, yung mga nurse, mga technicians, etc. May mga lumabas at nagparamdam ng galit over the non-payment of their sp uh, special risk allowance. Okay. But ironically, on the right side of the paper, Duterte pays tribute to hero frontliners. Parang play of words, eh. Pays tribute. Pays tribute, nagbabayad. Diba? Kung banga, para ka nagbabayad ng toll. But uh, in this case, uh, it was a verbal tribute, not a financial tribute. And the photo there goes... Pagpaba, pagpapabaya sa mga manggagawang pangkalusugan, sobra na, tama na. As far as the tally for number of cases, 22,366 and the number of deaths, 222. Meanwhile, Hong Kong has banned uh, PAL flights for the next two weeks or for two weeks. And on the bottom half of the paper, you will See Pacman Camp, Roddy Auster meant to save ruling party. So according to the spokesman of the PDP Laban uh, Pacman uh, faction, yung pag-alis po kay Presidente Duterte as the national president of the PDP Laban was meant to save the party. Meanwhile, Go declines endorsement as PDP Laban presidential bid. 
Ilang ulit ng sinabi yan ni Senator Bongo that he is not interested in running for president in 2022. May nagpipilit lang and evidently it's all part of a ano eh, sarsuela. That's all I can call it because you know it doesn't make sense. How can you make sense of a senator who... He has yet to prove himself as a senator being nominated as president. Anong K? Ha? Kahit sino? Ano ang K para sabihin si Bongo magpresidente? Anyway, under that story, we have DTI allows price hike for certain goods. So, ayan po. Eh, nako po. Masakit sa katawan yan. May price hike for certain goods. And then, yung Comelec, uh, Commission on Elections and SM Super Malls launched 76 satellites for voter registrations. 2022, every vote will count. Diyan magkakaalaman kung sino ang iboboto ng nakakarami. Okay, let's go to the News behind the headlines. The country logged in 2,000, I mean 2,000, 22,366 new COVID-19 cases yesterday. This is the highest single case count since the onset of the pandemic so far. The number of active COVID-19 cases increased to over 148,000. While, 20, uh, while 222 people recently died from the infection. Meanwhile, health workers from various hospitals walked out from their work and marched to demand the release of their Special Risk Allowance or SRA. The protesters held a noise barrage due to the late release of their overdue benefits under Bayanihan 2 law. And aside from this, they also want Health Secretary Francisco Duque III out from his office. Hindi po lumabas ng opisina, pinalalayas ng opisina. Okay. And sagot naman ni Duque, pag natapos na yung COA, pag nadepensahan ko na at nalinis ko na ang DOH sa COA, uh, I will not hold my breath. Okay, Senator Manny Pacquiao's faction in PDP Laban insisted the ouster of President Duterte as chairman. Uh, sandali. Uh, okay, mukhang putol to. Okay. Was due to Duterte as an overstay, overstaying president. <laughs> was that a figure of speech or was that technically correct? Overstaying na raw kasi si President Duterte as president of the PDP Laban. Since the chairperson and president can only serve a maximum of two years. Senator Coco Pimentel was elected as the new PDP Laban chairman, but Energy Secretary Alfonso Cusi's faction called this move a comedy. <clears throat> okay, uh, can somebody please play the music, uh, send in the clowns? Uh, well, oh, it's too late. They're all there already. Anyway, the quote of the day, alam nyo po, marami sa ating mga matatanda, natatandaan pa si Lord, sandali, sandali, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the poet, but... Uh, Medyo in recent days or recent months, his uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson was remembered because lumabas o nabanggit ha? one of his uh, pieces, uh, the poem titled The uh, Ulysses, was quoted or mentioned by Q, Q ba yun? Okay, by M, dun sa Skyfall. Okay, sa Skyfall, kung saan sa ako napupulot yung call for the day natin. Okay, but this is serious. In the face of what we are uh, going through, this is important. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength in which, which in old days moved earth and heaven, that strength which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts 
made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Okay, yan po, no? Yan yung sinabi ni Lord Tennyson. Eh, puntahan nyo na lang yung si, ano, si Judy Dench uh, Skyfall. She said this during a hearing in Parliament where uh, they were asking if they were still relevant, okay? But uh, that was her answer. And I think that is what we all have to be, you know? People, a nation, uh, humanity with grit and determination. We will go through hell and high water. We will lose friends. We will lose family. We will lose jobs. But we will survive because that's what we are. Okay? And we will strive. We will seek to find and not to yield. Okay. So, you know, Paul, no? Let's now go to the interview portion of Agenda. And our first agenda for the day is to find out what is the situation of pediatric COVID cases in the Philippines? Uh, what is the situation in the Philippine Children's Medical Center, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Let's bring in an expert, the spokesperson for COVID-19 and member of the PCMC Infection Prevention Control Committee, Dr. Fatima Jimenez. Doc Fatima, good morning to you, ma'am. Very, a very good morning to you, Mr. Beltran. It's uh, always nice to listen to people who are very le- relevant and. You really remind me of your dad. I, <laughs> I, your I hope dad you're talking. I, so good as well. I, I hope you're talking about voice, not girth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My father will That's kill so me. Good. And oh. I see shades of him in you. I'm okay, a fan well, of your dad, actually. Okay. So good morning to everyone. Good morning, doctor. And uh, let's go straight to the meat of today's first agenda, which is the pediatric cases. Well, uh, you're the expert. You are actually vice president, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, uh, society of uh, pedi- uh, vice president of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society of the Philippines. What is the situation of our children today? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Mr. Beltran, actually you see that uh, there is a rise of cases in children. And we see that because there's also a parallel increase in the number of adult cases who have the infection. So usually uh, with the current situation where children are still you know, not allowed to go out, it's usually the adults who bring in the infection to the homes. And now we see that it is happening in clusters. So that is the situation as of now. There is a parallel increase because there is also an increase in the adults who is are, the, have infection. Yes. Is the parallel increase, ju- just basing it on, on what you see in the hospitals, uh, what you see in your workplace, is the increase a very serious concern as in, uh, you know, in terms of levels of alert, are we in a red alert status already? Uh, because uh, everyone, that's how people seem to measure things. Wala na kaming hospital bed, wala na kaming ICU. For kids, wa- how serious is the situation? All right. Kids in general who are immunocompetent do very well, Right. Probably the situation that I can really refer to is in our institution because we take care of children with special needs. So we have chronically ill patients. So we see a little bit more of COVID in those chronically ill children. But in general, if you are immunocompetent, children do very well. Unlike adults with comorbids or, you know, they're a little bit advanced in age. But we are seeing a little bit more of cases in children now. Okay. The the prevailing mentality of so-called experts is that we don't have to worry about children too much because their resistance is greater, they're young, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, as you pointed out, if their resistance or uh, immuno, uh, immunity is strong, they're okay. But... But with the fa- in the face of Delta, the Delta variant, 
Does that still make sense or does that still hold true? In general, okay, this Delta variant is a little bit more vicious no? if you can if you compare it to last year. So it's still the general um, theme or landscape that if you are a little bit old with comorbids and you're less than a year old for COVID, and especially with comorbids, then you go a little sour. So that's the immune system landscape. Mm -hmm. But if you are like a little older, five and five years and above, and you don't have any comorbids, because there are a lot of conditions, like chronic conditions, like nephrotic, hematologic malignancies, okay? These children get it a little bit more, you know, serious. They are a little bit more serious if they get infected. Okay, uh, your yes. situation at the Philippine Children's Medical Center, uh, while it places, it puts you in a place where you can help and you can make a difference, I, I don't think I could go there every day and still be cheerful, uh, considering all of the cases that you face normally outside of COVID. But how has COVID-19 and especially the Delta variant changed the scenario in the inside PCMC? You know, PCMC has had a lot of um, people and we are a community that just focuses on serving. We've been doing that even before Delta came along, even before COVID came along. So I think what keeps us going is our mission to be able to serve those who are underprivileged because you know that a majority of our patients are very financially challenged and we have a pool and community of experts who are very selfless. All of us are on the same page. We do get tired, we do get frustrated, but what keeps us going is the fact that we can be someone's answered prayer by being the doctor, the nurse, the medical technologist, the admin who helps out these children. So. That's the thing. We can get frustrated, but we have faith we can do it. And of course, you know, who's the greatest healer? It's the guy upstairs. So those well, are the things that keep us going, being on one page. So thank you for that, Mr. Beltran, because you're giving us this opportunity to be able to share that because we also need some inspiration from the public that this is being appreciated. Okay, but what's the situation in the hospital uh, in terms right. of mortality, in terms of uh, illnesses? Uh, is it worse than before? Well, um, I think because of we're a multi-specialty hospital, so we get to have uh, children with chronic conditions. So they're the ones who get a little bit more serious, as I said before. Mm -hmm. So what is the situation for those people? And usually our hospital is like, um, the end hospital, right? So when they come to us, they're really bad already at the triage or at the ER because, you know, hospitals around us, because they are full as well, cannot mm -hmm. accept them. So when they come into our triage, we already have them in a very serious state. And it's sometimes, you know, very, very painful to let them wait in line. But we try to do our best. Our, our hospital is full. We are not a COVID facility. And of course, there's the problem of logistics because we have to take care of the healthcare workers as well. So the personal protective equipment is something that, you know, we need to prepare for as well because we need to preserve our community. And with this ongoing community transmission, Really, uh, everybody has to be very careful. So in our hospital, we've had ourselves vaccinated. We've volunteered for other government agencies who've had, who haven't had the opportunity for people to come to them because there are no doctors and no nurses or pharmacists who are available to administer okay. the vaccination. Can, can you just walk us through, uh, we have some time anyway, uh, can you just walk us through the situation because uh if if i bring a child to the pcmc this morning uh does the child have to be tested do i have to be tested as the guardian uh you mentioned ppes and face masks etc uh who will provide that could, could you walk us through please all right so 
we we see around uh, 60 to 70 patients in a day. So that's for all, right? And we have an algorithm or we call it a triaging system wherein if you have very overt signs and symptoms of COVID and in children, like in adults, it can be very nonspecific. So we have this acronym, cough, colds, fever, diarrhea, and we see people with seizures. So if you have any of those symptoms, you are highly suspect. But in this situation, everybody comes in with fever and any of the signs and symptoms that I mentioned, you you are already tagged as suspect. So everybody gets to be uh, assessed that way. And then what happens is, okay, you have to get tested. Because if you need to be admitted, then you need to be tested. So if you are a suspect, we try to, you know, uh, put you in the ER with all the precautions, and then if you turn positive, if there is a vacancy in our COVID ward, then you have to go into the COVID ward. Now, if you need someone to be with you, you cannot. we cannot have because of our uh, logistical space and we are under construction now, the companion cannot be with the person in the COVID ward. But if you are cleared, Right then, the companion then will have to be swabbed as well. So that is the situation. So we see around, you know, we've seen around forty thousand ever since the pandemic started. Forty thousand triaged patients, and we've had around one hundred ninety plus COVID children. How how has PCMC managed? to keep its walls up because I've heard of other hospitals, uh, especially down south, where the infection just took over the hospital. A lot of the nurses, doctors came down with COVID-19. Thank God, so far, thank God, we've not heard this kind of situation where COVID-19 just wreaked havoc among the health workers. How do you guys do it? I guess it's a very rigid uh, infection control committee that overlooks everything. So every day we've been firefighting. And we also have a lot of kind-hearted donors who just, you know, bring their donations. A lot of them are anonymous. So either they bring personal protective equipment, they provide food. And uh, these are the things that keep us going. Okay. Right? So the are the staff of BCMC all vaccinated? Yes, there's only a very small percentage, I think less than 3%, that have not been vaccinated, and we are still trying to convince them. But the majority of us are, and if there are COVID infections that we see among the healthcare workers, mostly we have traced that these are coming from the community and not acquired from the hospital. So. We have seen that in the COVID ward and in high-risk areas, if we get to just properly look at and observe these infection control measures and the mask is, okay, very effective, plus the face shield and proper hand washing, uh, we have been doing well, thank God. Okay, now you, you, mentioned, <clears throat> you mentioned donors, you mentioned PPEs. Uh, I understand that the Philippine Children's Medical Center is uh, concerned or experiencing shortages uh, or, or with the PPEs, particularly the N95 masks. Now, uh, what is the consumption level of uh, PCMC for masks? And why is it that the hospital needs to... Uh, ask for help. I mean, we all assumed that the national government, given the billions that was uh, uh, assigned in uh, Bayanihan 2, has uh, provided for that. Actually, uh, that's, uh, I think I'd, I'd like to really put out in black and white, you're asking me about consumption. Okay, so with the personnel, we need around 316 pieces per day because you have to keep on changing per shift because we don't have the luxury of having negative pressure rooms. That's one, right? So our N95 gets soiled and that is a very, you know, that having that mask is very protective. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply that, we would be needing around 9,400 plus. 
for a month for 30 days because we need to uh, provide these masks to our frontliners so that there will be enough protection. So that's the situation we're looking at. We still have, but definitely we're looking at you know the possibility of us rationing this in the future. For now, we can hold, but we know that this pandemic is going to take quite a long time, and that is a big dent. I mean, is that is, is that thing. even is that even allowable, uh, Doctora? Because uh, Doctora Jimenez, because uh, from what I understand, you're the doctor. I'm just I'm the journalist. Uh, from what I understand, if you go into a COVID in COVID area. Uh, when you go out, you dispose of that mask. You don't wander around the hospital wearing that mask. And the N95 mask, I, I understand, I, ideally, should not be worn longer than six hours. That's right. Even if you're a journalist, you have your statistics right, Mr. Beltran. So usually that, okay, that mask we're talking about, ideally, it's just it should it's supposed to be worn for... A length of eight hours. However, mm -hmm. that is not absolute because at any time that mask gets destroyed or soiled, right? We don't uh, have the conditions that would keep us comfortable. You know, those uh, protective equipment is very, it's very warm. It's very hot, actually. So okay. you need to be able to change that ideally every eight hours so that maximum protection be provided. So you'd need 9,400 plus, let's round it off to 9,500 N95 masks every month. Every uh, what month, a, yes. What about the PPEs, the, the gloves, the, the overalls, the boots? Uh, is there a need for that? The, is that a highly consumable item in Philippine Children's Medical Center? Yeah, thank you. Your, your gloves, okay, um, and your disposable gowns mm -hmm. are also we are also asking for the you know for donations if people are able to donate those items then those are very much welcome because they are also highly consumed with the yeah. current situation so so while while the hospital has its budget COVID-19 just basically skewered that budget and uh, uh, the demands are far greater than what the normal operation is. That's true. Even before the pandemic, Mr. Beltran, uh, PCMC has been accepting a lot more patients than our capacity because wow. we, cannot, we, we cannot turn that away. You could just imagine the stress. Um, in you know, when you see these patients who are like super serious, they've been turned away and they land in our hospital. So that in itself is a source of stress, you know, mental and uh, emotional stress for all of the healthcare workers. It's, okay. it's heartbreaking. Uh, I suppose, uh, I'm just curious, okay, a box of uh, N95 masks, are they boxed by 50s or 100s? Usually the the ones that uh, we are using are boxed in twenties. In twenties. In twenties, and they are of a certain um, model, right? If I may be bold enough to, yes. to say, okay, that we are looking at the one eight seven zero zero series, and usually these have to be checked. If it's uh, NIOSH, okay, it, it has to be approved. So if it's if it's uh, of medical grade quality, oh, we okay, we cannot afford to be providing our health workers with. I I, I am sorry to say this. There are also uh, products that are counter. Mm -hmm. Very right? true. So if they're counterfeit, then yeah. counterfeit. That's yeah. the term. Yeah. Then um, just imagine. Okay, you are putting someone in danger, and that do you have, does not take. Do you yes. have any idea how much a box of twenties cost? Okay, uh, it depends if you get it in uh, in 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 bulk. Yeah. So for us, okay, I just bought mine. Right, my box of twenties cost me around three thousand pesos, and that was because we we bought in bulk. So it's like around yeah, two hundred to three hundred per. 
So it's a little bit, um, you know, heavy on the pocket. But we don't want to compromise. Especially because we're talking about children who are already sick, who are already yeah. immunocompromised, and who are generally uh, part of the, uh, how do you call it, uh, they're indigent families, mga mahihirap. So, uh, pagtitipid pa tayo, parang it is too much of an injustice. Anyway, Doctora, uh, I, I, allow, let me give you time to please appeal to our viewers. I know it's not cheap, but marami naman dyan may pera, pero hindi mahawakan, hindi mahaplos, o mayakap yung apo. They cannot hug their grandchildren, their children. Maybe in their own little way, they can send uh, a donation, cash, or this uh, mas mabuti pa siguro ang cash kasi eh, ang hirap maghanap nitong medical grade. Eh. Baka mamaya, made, made in kaulun pa yung makuha namin. <laughs> Okay, uh, Doctor, please go ahead and uh, shout out or, or call out to our viewers. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Beltran, for giving this opportunity to us, the Philippine Children's Medical Center, to appeal to our kind-hearted citizens. You know, it's it's not about um, always the money, the right? There are a lot of things that you can do for us. So, whether this be in kind. Right, so that would I will have to say in the form of personal protective equipment, right? In any way, prayers, and um, if you have the capacity or you just want to do, you know, someone a good deed and be someone's answered prayer, please look at us. Okay, it's easy to find Philippine Children's Medical Center. You can Google us. You can. Contact Mr. Shali Abalos at 0947-6188783 or we have a landline. Okay, so our operator will be so willing to connect you to her. Our telephone is 8588-9900 uh, local 344. We'd like to thank also our previous donors and our donors currently, you don't want yourselves mentioned, but for everything that you do for us, you give us that added inspiration to be able to serve the children. So thank you very much. Dr. Fatima, uh, what's the name of the, uh, the girl or is it a guy, uh, Abalos? Okay, it's going to be Shalimar. Okay, we call her Shali. Shali okay. Abalos, she's our uh, donation darling. Right, so when her, no, her number is zero nine four zero nine four seven six one eight eight seven eight three, and our landline is eight five eight eight nine nine zero zero local three four four. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fatima Jimenez, and. Uh, Please keep in touch. Uh, let us know what's going on, and we will try our best to. Uh, I'll ask Arvik Tolentino, our executive producer, if they can make a slide uh, requesting for donations for the PCMC. Magandang umaga po, and, and thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat. Okay, that is Dr. Fatima Jimenez, uh, Vice President of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society of the Philippines and a spokesperson, Philippine Children's Medical Center. Uh, we will go for a quick break, I believe, and when we return, we will uh, go to our next guest here on Agenda. <music>
Okay, welcome back to the program agenda. I'm your host, Hito Beltran, and you are watching us via Signal TV channels 8 and 250. Please uh, spread the word, share the information to your friends, subscribe to Signal TV. And we also want to thank PLDT for uh, helping us through the months, uh, especially here in Lipa. Double connection po kami. Meron ako sa Kapitolyo, meron pa dito because as far as a uh, home fiber optic internet goes, I'm not going to go anywhere else. They are so fast and that's why we are able to broadcast mula din po sa Lipa City. Let's now go to the next topic, the next agenda of agenda. We are wondering, we would like to figure out from an independent uh, opinion and someone with expertise is the current strategy, the last year and a half strategy of the Philippine government regarding COVID still valid, especially in the face of Delta variant COVID-19, as well as the developments, the fact that we are now in a critical list of countries. Kumbaga, kasama na tayo doon sa bottom end, 58 ba yun o 59, na... Kumbaga, eh, kinikilala or we are uh, basically uh, considered high risk, high risk country for COVID-19. So anyway, let's go to our next guest, former Department of Health Secretary, Dr. Esperanza Cabral. Dr. Sec, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Sito. Good morning sa mga nakikinig sa iyo. Okay, and uh, sana po nadagdagan na yung sampo, no? Baging labing isa na. <laughs> Baka 100,000 naman. <laughs> anyway, uh, Secretary Cabral, uh, I, we, first question would be, given the recent development, we've hit 22,000 plus new cases. We have been reaching uh, this high mark for a week already. We have Delta variant. And then ngayon, nakasama na tayo. We're included in the list of high-risk critical countries. Uh, is the government's current strategy still valid? Itong uh, solved by quarantine and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, kung ang pag-uusapan natin ay quarantine at lockdowns, it's clear that um, it is not doing the job that we want it to do. And that the reason is, uh, if you look at the kind of uh, enhanced community quarantine that we have these days, it is very different from the kind of enhanced community quarantine that we had, say, March last year. During those days, wala ka talagang makikitang sasakyan sa, sa kalye, di ba? Mm -hmm. At walang mga tao sa malls, ganyan. But these days, miski na ECQ pa tayo, eh maraming sasakyan, traffic na traffic, parang walang ECQ. Sa malls, may mga tao din. At syempre, uh, sawa na yung mga tao sa kaka-lockdown. Hindi na sila masyadong sumusunod doon sa mga patakaran. At kung makikita mo naman yung mga tao na nagpapasunod nitong mga patakaran na to, ini-ignore na rin nila yung mga yon kesa hulihin pa nila yung mga tao, siguro ang ginagawa lang nila, pinagsasabihan na lang nila. Okay, now, uh, does this make sense to you? Kasi, uh, I don't know, I don't want to play doctor here. Baka mamaya may magsabi na naman dyan na, di ka naman doktor eh, ba't ka ba nagdo-doktor-doktor? But uh, does this make sense to you that that we are trying to merge? Because uh, yesterday, I know that a bunch of uh, businessmen had a town hall meeting pushing for uh, granular lockdown and Pa, uh, allowing vaccinated, fully vaccinated people to go out, uh, be part of the economic uh, process, yung kumbaga punta na restaurant, malls, etc., basta fully vaccinated. And does this make sense to you? Uh, yes, actually it does. Um, because our economy has really been brought to its, to its knees by the health interventions that uh, we did to prevent COVID-19 from spreading. But it's the horse is out of the barn. Let's put it that way. 
Um, mm -hmm. COVID-19 is everywhere. So there is no use closing that door again. So I agree that if we are going to do lockdowns, it will have to be limited to the specific area where we found the index cases of COVID-19, rather than locking down the whole region, like the whole of NCR or the whole of Region 3 or 4, let yeah. us perhaps do more uh, limited lockdowns to, say, barangays um, within a town or within a province. That's one. The second is uh, the proposal to allow vaccinated individuals to be served by vaccinated individuals in entertainment areas and food outlets and things like those. There is always a risk, okay? The vaccination is not 100% effective, mm -hmm. but the risk is very much reduced. And even if you have COVID-19 after you have been fully vaccinated, the chances are it is going to be a mild case of COVID-19. So as a solution to the inability of our economy to recover at this point, I think that is something we should seriously consider. Ang nangyayari ngayon is nagre-reklamo yung mga walang bakuna. Sinasabi nila na unfair sa kanila yon na ang pwede lang lumabas ay yung may bakuna at ang pwede lang magsilbi ay yung merong bakuna. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, it's really for their own good also. Not just for the good of the people who have been vaccinated, but for them. Mm -hmm. Kasi kung tamaan naman sila ng bakuna pin dahil pinayagan silang ay, ng bakuna, tinamaan sila ng COVID. ng COVID dahil pinayagan silang gumala, eh, mas malala ang aabuti nila dahil the hospital bills. And it's, it, it can kill them. Unlike people who are vaccinated, if you get it, it won't necessarily kill you uh, or land you in the ICU. Now, uh, I, I was told recently, someone called my attention to what's developing in, in Europe, where they're now no long, uh, they're beginning to think differently. They, they, uh, my friend said it is more towards treating COVID-19 as endemic instead of a pandemic. Kasi, uh, but sabi ko, teka, uh, kukuha pa akong diksyonaryo. Pagtanungin ko na lang <laughs> si Secretary Cabral, ano ba ang difference ng I view that is pandemic versus endemic? Well, ang, pang, ang pandemic, ang ibig sabihin niya ay buong mundo ay apektado nitong infection na ito. Okay? Mm -hmm. Pag sinabi mong endemic ay merong mga lugar na palaging meron itong uh, COVID-19 virus. So mm -hmm. merong mga tao na magkakasakit ng COVID-19 infection. Uh, ang ginagawa na lang natin ay kung magkasakit sila ay gagamutin natin sila. Katulad ng ibang viral illnesses like influenza or like meningitis, mga ganyan na alam natin na nandyan palagi yung COVID-19 virus at pwedeng ma-infect ang isang tao o dalawa at kung mangyari yon ay gagamutin yung tao na yon. Actually, that is precisely the reason kung bakit tayo nagla-lockdown. It's not just to prevent transmission, it is to buy time so that the healthcare system can improve its capacity to handle these particular illnesses. Okay, now what about the reporting? Because that, that view also presents that we should stop highlighting the number of cases, uh, whether new or uh, absolute uh, numbers, but highlight the number of uh, severe to critical cases kasi parang disproportionate daw yun. Uh, in a pandemic or endemic situation, there will always be a high number, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the numbers will be severe or critical. Well, we do that. If you look at the report of the Department of Health, they tell you what the cases are, how many percent are asymptomatic, how many percent are mild, how mm -hmm. many are moderate or severe or critical. So the data is actually there. 
-hmm. So all you need to do is look at the daily report. If that is what you want to see, the data is there. Mm -hmm. But but should we do away with with highlighting the number of new cases or total number? Because I personally, I've always had an issue with the number of total cases. Parang uh, sorry, mat take seven ako sa mat eleven eh. Pero uh, ang na we weird ako don. I find that strange. Why do we still tell the world or tell each other? Oh, we have a million plus, or or we have about oh, two million. Parang eh. Cured Danny, healed Danny. Why are you still <laughs> reporting it? Um, the DOH is required to report it. Whether mm -hmm. it is picked up by media is something that is the choice of media, not the DOH. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, choice na na. Kami na naman. Kami. Lagi na lang kami. <laughs> <laughs> Kasi, pa, parang COA report yun eh, di ba? Yung COA, magbibigay ng report. Whether you pick it up or not, is up to you. COA is not going to tell you, uy, i-report mo naman ito. In the same way that DOH is not going to say, uy, i-report mo naman ito. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, moving forward, uh, what what is your reaction regarding ito namang mga protest ng mga health workers? Because uh, when I saw it, especially on TV last night, uh, various channels featured it, I said to my wife, this could be a game changer. This could be, this could change the landscape of politics and governance in this country. Uh, when health workers are already openly, publicly defiant in their protest. Well, I hope it is a game changer talaga, um, Sito, because uh, kung titignan mo, yung mga health workers, isang grupo, isa sa mga grupo na pinakakimi, let's put it that way, sa pagre-reklamo tungkol sa kanilang uh, working conditions. Uh, hindi sila nagsasalita, karamihan ng uh, opportunities, miski na nahihirapan sila. So, pag nagsalita sila ng ganyan, ibig sabihin, talagang may problema. At yeah. kailangang ayusin ng ating pamahalaan. Um, a, a year and a half ago, when this pandemic was just starting, a group of us put up out a paper that said, these are the four imperatives that we should do. First is to know the enemy. And nandyan yung testing and tracing. Second is to treat, treat the patients. So nandyan yung isolation, quarantine, finally hospitalization kung kinakailangan. Third is to treat the healthcare workers. And finally, protect the citizens. Uh, kung titignan mo, hindi sapat yung ating tugon dun sa apat na yon Pero, ang pinaka hindi sapat ay yung last two. Yung protect the healthcare workers at protect the citizenry. Talagang mm -hmm. nakalimutan yung healthcare professionals. In, in, what way, in, in what way, uh, Sector Brel? Ah, well, ito ang nangyayari, di ba? Na merong pera na inilaan ang ating kongreso para sa pagbibigay sa kanila ng kanilang special risk allowance, ng kanilang mm -hmm. meal accommodation and travel allowance, pero hindi na ibigay sa kanila. Hindi ko alam kung bakit. Pero biro mo yon isang taon at kalahati nilang tiniis ito bago sila nagreklamo. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, I don't know if you got to watch the first part of the show where I interviewed Dr. Fatima Jimenez of the PCMC. Kasi yes. actually may nag-shout out sa akin, Kuyang, tulungan mo naman yung PCMC because uh, kinakapos sila ng, uh, ng uh, N95 medical grade face mask. Sabi ko, ano? Paano nangyari yun? Eh, government hospital yan. They're supposed to be taken care by the Bayanihan too. I mean, is this normal? Uh, do you see something wrong with this, uh, Dr. Cabral? Actually, nakakadismaya talaga. Noong umpisa, uh, wala pang binibigay talaga ang gobyerno na sapat dito sa mga personal protective equipments na ito. The private sector stepped up and many of them 
uh, donated. For example, the UP College of Medicine Foundation partnered with the Towns Foundation, and then they accepted donations from um, generous individuals, and the money mm -hmm. was spent to buy PPEs for hospitals, and they were able to provide for more than 600 hospitals and health facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is at the start, okay? The private sector understands na biglaan kailangan tumulong. Pero it's already a year and a half. Dapat by this time, yung system of um, purchasing, distributing the personal protective equipments to the health workers that need them should be there already. After all, lots of money have been appropriated by Congress for this. And sadly, it turns out that the money has not been spent. And yeah, therefore, you know, yeah. hindi na, hindi kulang pa rin yung PPEs ng ating mga healthcare workers. Let me ask you this question, and I'm not trying to politicize matters, okay? But you are, you were a former Secretary of Health, so you understand the workings of the department. Now, I've always found it bewildering, to say the least. Now, when it came to the purchase of PPEs, etc., I'm sure you're aware of the current uh, issue or controversy na yung DOH pumayag na DBM ang mamili ng kanilang mga kailangan. Uh, from all the years I've been a Filipino citizen, I was always under the impression that only the department can spend its budget and none other. Uh, what's, what is the correct answer to this? Well, this procedure of uh, returning money to the DBM so that they can do the purchase uh, only happened recently. It did not happen during my time, for example, and I suppose it did not happen also even during the time of Secretary Duque before me. Mm -hmm. Only in his administration and only in this amount did this happen. Um, I don't know why. But 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 is that uh, correct? I mean, as a former secretary, would you say that ah, that's that's uh, correct because that is allowed? Is it allowed or not allowed historically? Uh, well, during my time, we just never thought of doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe now, uh, the DBM said, maybe if you're having a hard time doing the procuring, let us do it for you. And then the department, like the Department of Health, said, okay, you can purchase this for us. So the money that you gave to us, we will return it to you, and you spend it, and just give us the goods later. Okay. Uh, let's go for a quick break, Secretary Cabral. And uh, when we come back, let's continue with our conversation because may mga katanungan pa regarding the resignation or uh, pending resignation daw ni Secretary <laughs> Duque dependent on... I have to be... I mean, pending. Kasi subject to COA clearance daw. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll go for a quick break. And uh, when we return, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. We'll be right back here on Agenda. Okay. Welcome back to the program agenda. I'm your host, Sita Beltran, and you are watching us via Signal TV, channels 8 and 250, as well as on YouTube, 
One News PH. Okay, and of course, facebook.com slash One News PH. Let's go back to our guest, Secretary Esperanza Cabral. You know, uh, Sec Cabral, uh, no flattery uh, in hand, but uh, I forgot to mention I like the new look. You are all fresh and pretty. Bigyan mo ng bonus yung gumawa ng haircut mo. <laughs> Salamat. Salamat, okay, uh, Sec Cabral, um, Secretary Duque has uh, stated that he will resign. Just give him time to clear all the issues with COA. Uh, as a former secretary, is uh, if assuming uh, he has decided he will resign, is, is that conditionality valid? Uh, wala bang ibang pwedeng humarap at mag-clear ng DOH uh, with Goa so that he can actually push through with his alleged or uh, supposed uh, plan to resign? Siyempre, merong ibang pwedeng humarap sa COA para linisin kung ano man yung mga nasa report nila. Kaya nga, nung sabihin ni Secretary Duque na, I will resign after I have cleared myself of the COA issues. Para sa akin, ang ibig sabihin nun, eh, he's not going to resign anytime soon dahil alam naman natin kung ano yung proseso ng pagsagot sa mga reports na ganyan, eh, napakatagal niyan. Aabuti na yan ng next administration. Okay. Would there be anybody who would be heroic enough or stupid enough to take that position if he resigns? Uh, tama ka dyan, um, Sito. Ako ay eh, naaawa sa susunod na magiging kalihim ng kalusugan. Dahil mm-hmm. napakarami ng problema na haharapin niya kaagad. So I hope there is going to be somebody heroic enough to do that and to do a good job. What would that person have to do immediately? Kasi uh, last minute, ano ka na lang, uh, Jackie, ika nga, para, para, uh, para kang ugas na replacement boxer ka a uh, few a week before the bout or two weeks before the bout. Eh, ano ang pwedeng gawin ng uh, potential candidate to, to make an impact? Well, he will have to face this immediate problem, which is uh, COVID and our response to it. He must improve our testing and tracing capabilities. He must um, increase the number of isolation and quarantine beds or fix home quarantine policies so that people who have mild or asymptomatic COVID disease do not have to go to these facilities, particularly the children. Uh, It is going to be very bad for their mental health. If they go there and they're not allowed their mothers because their mothers might get infected, it will be a terrible situation for children. Anyway, next is he must improve the um, hospitalization facilities and services. After that, again, he must uh, take care of the healthcare professionals, the healthcare workers, mm-hmm. but- and uh, whatever it is that they, that is due them. I hope that the next Secretary of Health is going to make sure that they get them at the soonest time possible. Last question, Secretary. Quick answer na lang because we've run out of time, but is all that doable, even if there was enough time? Is it all doable given how the bureaucracy, the, how government or the president created the bureaucracy to fight the pandemic? Because there is an NTF, my IATF, my deal. Is it possible? Yes, he should take the next Secretary of Health should take the leadership of uh, the COVID response seriously and really do it. At the moment, actually, the IATF is chaired by the Secretary of Health and the National uh, Task Force for Implementation is under the IATF. He is also the chair of PhilHealth. There is no reason why he cannot uh, impose his authority for them to be able to do a better job than is being done at present. Okay, well, uh, that's a very good point. 
And uh, <laughs> I, I won't say anything anymore. Check Cabral kasi baka mapaaway pa ako ngayong umaga. Anyway, thank you very much for all of your important inputs and your, your very uh, clear uh, analysis of the situation. We hope to continue to have you on the program. And please stay safe. And we love the look. God bless you. Thank you, Sito. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's Secretary Esperanza Cabral, former Secretary of Health, giving us her analysis of the situation of the government's fight against pandemic. I hope to see you tomorrow, God willing. And uh, thank you for joining us. Please keep it here on One News PH. That's the agenda for the day. <laughs>